All right, well, this morning, if you want to get out your Bibles, we're making our way to a new book, The Little Minor Prophet of Amos. While you're trying to find Amos, make you aware that we have baptisms again after church. So after this service is over, if you want to go get your kids, then we'll assemble at the baptismal beach, and you can watch us shiver and quake in the now chilly water for Jesus. Four souls making a commitment to Jesus publicly after church. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so... As we arrive in Amos, then let me remind you that the minor prophets are called minor, not because their message is any less powerful, it's because they use less words to convey what God has told them. In the case of Amos, his name actually means burden, which is interesting when you think about the fact that at least Nahum and Habakkuk call their prophecies in the old King James a burden, a burden, an oracle, a prophecy towards a certain people group. His burden was towards the northern kingdom of Israel, even though, as we're going to find, he lived in the south. And his themes are similar to that of Hosea, which we covered just a few weeks ago, but he also borrows from Joel. So if you're familiar with those two prophets, then you'll be familiar with the themes in Amos. <clears throat> when I think about Amos, then, I should let you know he's a contemporary of Hosea in that he prophesied towards the end of Hosea's ministry, but they also were prophesying to the same people in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel. And while Hosea prophesied possibly the longest of all of the prophets in the Old Testament, some people believe he could have prophesied as much as 70 years, for sure, four decades Amos likely prophesies the shortest period of time. Some people think maybe up to a few months, but as short as one week. So he came on the scene, and then he was gone. Now, then Amos, the outline, uh, really easy. First six chapters, eight nations denounced. So I know you guys love this. We begin with judgment. And then... Chapters 7 through 9, five visions announced. So he's going to indict or denounce eight nations, and then he's going to give five visions from the Lord. That's how the book breaks out. So then chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Well, let's start by just making mention that Amos is a shepherd. He wasn't a professional prophet. In fact, if you want to go with me to the reference I have there for you in Amos chapter 7, verse 14, he goes to minister up in Bethel which is where the king's chapel was, where all the religious elite hung out. And once he begins to give his message, the priest of Bethel, a guy named Amaziah, confronts him. And he says, you don't speak here ever again. And Amos, in verse 14, answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and he said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. And so he says, I didn't come up here because I thought you'd like my message. I didn't come up here because I needed your approval. I came up here because I was tending the sheep, and then God called me to be a prophet, and so I came up here and said what he told me to say. So when you think about Amos, he's not like some of the other prophets. Jeremiah was a priest by background. Isaiah was a prophet to kings. But here's Jeremiah. He was a sheep breeder, and he was a tender of fruit, 
and he was also famous for his cookies. Amos, that is. Famous Amos. By the way, they say of Amos that he is the working man's prophet, much like our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was a common man. He was every man's man in that sense. And so too Amos. And they say that when they would meet Amos as he was walking to and fro, and they'd say, hey, what's your name? He would say, they call me the working man. That's what I am. That's what they say. Anyway, Amos, he was a shepherd. And so he is, by background, a herdsman. He's a sycamore fruit tender. And so I like Amos because he spoke from his background. When you read him, he's very plain spoken. And even though he is poetic, he's very direct and he's to the point. He's got a message to give and he's going to give it. And yet when he does use illustrations, it's illustrations of his experience. It's fruit, it's sheep, it's hills, it's fields. And so God uses Amos's background. Now I'd like to point out to you, Amos was small town. He was from, verse 1 says, the small town, really a dot on the map called Tekoa. And Tekoa is on the border of the Judean hills and then the desert. And yet here he is from the south, little dot on the map, and God calls him to go up to the more polished north, out of his comfort zone, you might say. He also is prophesying to a people that probably don't very much feel like they need God because he prophesies under the prosperous reigns of in the south where he lived, Uzziah, and in the north where he prophesied, Jeroboam II, they both were very successful economically and geopolitically. There was a lot of stability. There wasn't a ton of military hubbub in their day, but economically things were good. And so the people were pretty content. So that's the group he's speaking to. And yet, it says he prophesied two years before the earthquake. And so when you think about that, then you find that the earthquake we know happened in the days of Uzziah. And we know that because it's such a big deal, this earthquake, that in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5, 250 years later, Zechariah makes mention of that earthquake in the days of King Uzziah. This is uh, the New Madrid Fault, Mississippi River running backward type of deal. This is a whopper, so around 760 B.C. And Zechariah prophesies uh, that another earthquake like that one is going to happen at the end days. Amos, he prophesied before that one happened in the days of Uzziah. Now, uh, verse 2. Here he goes. He starts his prophecy. The Lord roars from Zion, and he utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. So here he sets the tone. Remember, I told you, he's a plain-spoken guy. Right out of the gate, the Lord roars in Zion. And this he takes from Joel, chapter 3, verse 16, from our study last week. This is how Joel wraps up his series on the day of the Lord. And so this is the key note of Amos. The Lord is not going to mealy mouth around. He's no pansy. When he shows up to set things right and to correct injustice, he's going to roar from Zion, which is his holy hill. And so he's setting the tone. He comes in hot, does Amos. And that said then, that leads us to verse 3. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. Now before we get going, just let me talk about this phrase for three and for four. This is a pleonasm. He's using more words than necessary for effect, but it's also idiomatic in the sense that he's not listing three sins and then four of the nations that he's going to indict. It's an idiomatic statement to draw people's attention to the severity of their sin. He could have picked any number of sins, but he's using this phrase 
to draw their attention to the sin or a couple sins that he highlights. It's used eight times in chapters 1 and 2. If we had enough time, we would cover these two chapters together because it's one discourse. And what happens is this. It's used one time for each of the eight nations he indicts. Now, what he's doing is he's starting out here. These nations surround Israel. And you would think if you were an Israelite hearing this, you'd be pretty excited initially when he starts this discourse because all of these nations listed, the first six that is, are perennial enemies of Israel. They're people who have been harassing them and doing them wrong. And as Amos is pronouncing judgment upon them, you can imagine the people going, it's about time that God took care of those people. But what's happening, unbeknownst to them, until it's probably straight in their face, is it's concentric circles of judgment, and what it's doing is it's marching towards the epicenter of judgment, and that is, I looked in the mirror, and I saw the enemy, and it was me, Israel. They're worse off than everybody else because they've been given the oracles of God. They had responsibility based upon light, and so they're actually at the center of Amos's bullseye. The noose is tightening around Israel over chapters 1 and 2. So that's how you need to read this over this week and next. So when you think about this then, chapter 3, verse 2 of Joel says that God judges the nations according to their treatment of Israel. And that's what they're doing here. They've ill-treated Israel. Why? And by the way, you might ask this question today. Why still do nations, and increasingly our own nation, hate Israel so badly? The only answer is it's supernatural. They hate God's people because they hate God is what amounts to. So that said then, here we go. Verse 3, I'll start again. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Why? Because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive, notice, to Ker, says the Lord. And so as we look at these nations, the Hendites, let me say that we have covered each of these and their relationship to Israel in detail in the major prophets, specifically Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So we're not going to go into detail. What I just want to do is show you their sin, their sentence, and then a near fulfillment if it's there. So in this case, Syria, or their capital city of Damascus, their sin is they harassed Gilead. Now, if you would look at that map, Damascus is where it is today in Syria, same city, same place. To the south, uh, Syria is also known as Aram in some of your Bibles. So to the southern part of that area is the land of Gilead, lies to the east of the Sea of Galilee, the east of uh, Israel. And here's what happened. At the time the nation of Israel entered the promised land and began to take it from the Canaanites, there were a few tribes, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, that said to Moses, look, we don't really want to go in. We've been on the east side here in this land of Gilead. It's beautiful over here. We got stock. This is better than anything we'll find over there. Can we just stay? And so Moses asked God, and God said, yeah, you can stay, but you got to go fight for the land which I gave you. That's where you're supposed to be. But if you ask, I'll let you stay, but you got to go fight. So they fight for ostensibly seven years. They come back to the east side, and they stay. And all seems well. They didn't go where God wanted them, but he made a concession, and so they're happy over there, except there's a problem. Because, you see, one of the things that makes Israel unique geographically, is the whole of the land is cut off by, at the top, Sea of Galilee, 
the Jordan River, which runs almost the whole of its uh, eastern border, and then down to the bottom, the Dead Sea. And in those days, when you would go out to war, it would be the springtime. And in the springtime, the Jordan River overflows all of its banks, making, making a natural barrier and protecting the nation of Israel from invading armies. They would have to go all the way up and around and come. Typically, they would come down from the north, making it very difficult. Yet, those that settled, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe Manasseh, and Gilead were easy pickings. So from that day forward, settling for second best, God allowing them to do something that he didn't tell them to do, they have been harassed, the Gileadites, to this day. They still are harassed by those from Syria. So the next time you decide to talk God into something that might be second best, consider the Gileadites. <laughs> now, all that said, the sentence for them harassing Gilead is God's going to send fire and he's going to break the gate of Damascus and he's going to carry them off captive to Kerr. The fulfillment of that is in 2 Kings chapter 16. I want to read it for you. There is a king from Israel named Ahaz, and he was being harassed by the Syrians in Damascus, so he paid an Assyrian, not the same, that's modern-day Turkey, he paid an Assyrian king to take out Syria or Damascus. And it's covered there in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 9. So the king of Assyria heeded him, that is Ahaz, for the king of Assyria went up and carried Damascus and took it and carried its people captive to where? Kerr, just like Amos said, and killed Rezin, their king. And so it was fulfilled, just as 2 Kings chapter 16, uh, verse 9 says. Now, we move on, and when we move on, we move to Philistia. Verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom, but I will send fire upon the wall of Gaza and devour its palaces, and I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon, and I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Now the Philistines, their sin is that they sold the Israelites into slavery to Edom. Their sentence is that God will destroy their five key cities listed here in these verses. Of course, one of those key cities is a place that's in the news right now, Gaza. That's become a region. But God will destroy these five key cities for them always doing Israel wrong, including taking them captive and selling them. The near fulfillment to that is found in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 8. When King Hezekiah of Judah subdued the Philistines, it says, as far as Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. So he began taking out the Philistines. Just so you know that when you think about the Philistines and then you think about the conflict that's going on now in Israel uh, with the Palestinians or these Palestinian terror groups, the word Palestine is actually a derivative of the word Philistine. The word Palestine did not exist until after 70 AD when the Romans sacked Jerusalem and later the Emperor Hadrian wanted not only to sack the city, but he wanted to eliminate any history of the Israelites. So he renamed the land Palestine, which is a derivative of Philistine, their mortal enemies. So there is no Palestinian people. It's a name for a conglomeration or groups of people that live in a region that was renamed to wipe out uh, the memory of Israel. So Philistia, God's taking care of them then, and of course we see now. And then verse 9, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood, but I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre 
which shall devour its palaces. Now, this one hurts for the Israelites because Phoenicia, its capital city, Tyre, that's modern-day Lebanon, their sin was breaking the covenant, it says here, of brotherhood. And long ago in the nation of Israel, David, and then later his son Solomon, I have the reference for you here in 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 12, had made covenants with Hiram, king of Tyre. They were buddies. In fact, when Solomon built the temple and the palaces, he actually contracted with Hiram, who had been his dad's buddy, to float down the cedars to build them. And Hiram, because he knew how much it took to build buildings with cedars, sent them skilled workmen so that they wouldn't mess the thing up. He sent his own workmen down. They were buddies. They were in cahoots with one another. They had made a covenant. But later, Tyre, the Phoenicians broke it. And God says, I don't take that thing lightly. And he's going to send fire on Tyre and devour its palaces. Now, if you were with us in Ezekiel, you remember in chapter 26. If not, you can go to the app and listen. It's an amazing prophecy against Tyre and Sidon, where exactly what is said here is prophesied in detail and history helps us understand that what happened was Nebuchadnezzar originally in about 586 B.C. rolled up on Tyre and he besieged the city. And after years of being unable to take it, he finally was about to breach the walls and the city actually picked up. It's a coastal city. And in a flotilla moved out to an island where they went, nah, 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 can't get us. And Nebuchadnezzar could not get them. He didn't have the navy to get them a half mile off the shore, and there they remained, untaken. The first city torn down, old Tyre. The second city, there they were. People said the prophecy won't be fulfilled. But then Ezekiel 26 goes on to talk about not a he attacking them, but a they, and that is a guy named Alexander the Great with conscripted armies that he had conquered their peoples and then taken them as his labor force. And he rolled up and he saw them out there thumbing their nose at him. And he said, I think there's an answer to this. So he took the rubble that Nebuchadnezzar had left after he sacked the main city and he constructed a causeway for a half mile out to the city and then burned that city to the ground, just like the Bible says, get out of here. God always does what he says he will do. Phoenicia. That was their sin. Then, verse 11, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity, and in his anger he tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send fire upon Teman, major city, which shall devour the palaces of Basra, another major city. So we come to Edom. Edom, as you know, was a nation that descended from Esau, the brother of Jacob, who's also called Israel. Israel and Edom were brothers at birth. Their sin was they pursued their brother with the sword. And if you know Edom, from the time they were in the womb, they were fighting with Israel, the forefather and then the followers. And so this was always the case. The sentence is that God will send fire upon Teman and devour Basra. And in fact, in a few weeks, probably 12 weeks, we will be in Obadiah. I want you to turn there just a few pages to your right. Obadiah is the proclamation against Edom. Edom is known for one thing. You might write this in your Bible if you don't have a fancy study Bible that does this for you. This is a proclamation against pride. Edom is synonymous with pride. From Esau to his descendants, the nation of Edom, they are known for pride. And in that pride, they pursued their brother, who God told them to leave alone. But they couldn't leave it alone. They just had this inferiority complex. They had been cheated. And so here's what they did, verse 12 of Obadiah. There's only one chapter in it. But you should not have, God speaks through Obadiah to Edom, gazed on the day of your brother in his captivity. 
nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should have entered the gate of my people, uh, and you shouldn't have entered it on that day of calamity and then gazed on them in their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. For as the day of the Lord upon all nations is near, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. And so he says, you had a chance to do good, and you, in fact, took advantage of your brother instead of defending him, and I'm going to repay you. And if you go to that part of the country, and I have been there, Edom is in what is known as southern uh, Jordan today, then you will find not one Edomite running around. And while we don't know exactly when this fulfillment happened, you can see that there are beautiful stone buildings cut into walls there, especially in the city of Petra, but not one person uh, exists living there anymore. That's an Edomite. And then we go to Ammon. And by the way, when we get to Ammon, this is worse than PG-13. Remember, he is a plain-spoken prophet. For three transgressions of the people of Ammon, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their territory. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle, and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, says the Lord. And so we end in this chapter with Ammon, whose sin is one of immense cruelty. They ripped open the women with child and killed the babies from their wombs. And the sentence is, God says, I will take and kindle a fire against your capital city of Rabbah. By the way, Ammon is the same word for the capital city in Jordan now, modern day Ammon. So just so you know, that's where we're talking about. The fulfillment of this is not known exactly when it happened, but again, like so many, we get details in Jeremiah and Ezekiel about how God was going to do this, and we do know that they were judged by the Lord, and not just once, but over and over and over. So these predictions that were fulfilled literally. Now, uh, what I want to do is conclude like this. And uh, as I conclude, what I want to make sure we do is find... Uh, some tangible takeaways from this because sometimes it's hard. You show up this morning, you got up, you brushed your teeth, you fought with your family to get to church, and you're like, Philistia, and baby's getting cut out of the womb. I mean, it's, it's not easy stuff, right? So why did I show up? Well, hopefully I can give you a couple takeaways. I'll try for four, and then, uh, and then we'll conclude. The first one is, when I think about Amos, I think about a guy who uh, God uses, and uh, it seems to me that God uses anyone who makes themselves available to him. You know, when I think about my own story, I really love Amos because when I started this church, I had a two-year degree in auto body. doesn't help you out too much. Primer, the Pentateuch. I had managed to flunk my way out of College of the Ozarks, majoring in Budweiser. <laughs> and I had a minor in Jagermeister. I um, had went back to Maxim while I worked at U.S. Tool. God called me to go to Bible college. I moved across the country for an unaccredited Bible college of two years. I was one year into Bible college when the church I was ministering at the pastors came to me and said, why would you go to Bible college? You already got six months more than our pastor Ray, and look how good he's doing. Why don't you just get to work? So I dropped out of unaccredited Bible college, and then I arrived here. What could go wrong? <laughs> but see, I, I really liked Calvary Chapel because what they said was, uh, we care 
about you knowing God and having the Holy Spirit upon your life more than education or pedigree. Those things can be used. They're, they're not bad. I, I've been going back to school for 20 years. I, I went the hardest route you can go. I wouldn't recommend it. But what I can say is that what I loved about the Calvary Chapel movement is it used people who loved the Word of God, who studied it, who were gifted to teach it, and that submitted themselves to it. And then what happens is instead of getting like a cooker, cookie cutter voice for a certain people that God's fashioned, which that's the funny thing about being a pastor, God assembles around you people who will at least put up with you, even if they don't really like you. You know, your voice, uh, they'll at least, you know, they'll, they'll put up with it, even if they don't like it. But, but what happens is it's a voice that's unique. It's your own voice. And I really like that, that everybody I listened to, the voice was based out of their experience, and God was using, you know, their, their likes and their dislikes and their bumps and their victories and their defeats, you know, to convey the message the way he would for a certain people. So God can use anybody, and knowing God does matter more than education or pedigree. In fact, I want to take you one place to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And the setup here is early after Jesus has died and rose again and ascended, Peter and John are arrested for preaching, and they are brought before the Sanhedrin who have education, they have pedigree. And when they're done before the Sanhedrin, verse 13 says that when the Sanhedrin saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived, look, they're uneducated and they're untrained, and they marveled. They marveled at what they talked about and how they talked about it and the power with which they communicated it. And what did they realize? They realized that they had been with Jesus. They'd been with Jesus. And so, by the way, if I could say one thing, it's this. It's of the 12 apostles that Jesus had around him, there was one man more educated and polished than any of the apostles. Do you know who that was? Judas. Consider that. And then I would take you one other place to 1 Corinthians. You're familiar with this, chapter 1, verse 26, where Paul writes to a people who thought they were pretty special. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are not, excuse me, that are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And why is this? Why does he choose the base things, the foolish things? That verse 29, no flesh should glory in his presence. So I love the fact that God uses anybody who makes themselves available and that submits themselves to God. And they say, and they know a lot of things, that if you need one ability in the economy of Christ, it's availability. How did Amos get called? He was out with the, shep, the sheep as a shepherd, and he had time on his hands, and he was contemplating the stars. Where did David write all of his poetry from? Where did he get this heart after God? He was available while he was out doing what he did. Make yourself available to God, and there's nothing he can't do in and through a heart completely submitted to him. And then I'd just like to say that my God-given audience may not be where I would expect it. In fact, it might be where I least expect it. He takes Amos from following the sheep to Bethel, and there he uses him even for an albeit brief time. And I can say in my own life, I found this to be the case when I lived in San Diego, the funny thing was I had nothing in common with any of these people. Uh, they could see a redneck coming from a mile away. But since I was the only Ar Ozarkian, I was such a novelty that people would actually listen for a short amount of time to what I had to say because uh, <laughs> it was, I was like sideshow Bob, you know. <laughs> but God uses the foolish things, you know. So anyway, don't limit God by picking out in advance where you think he might have you. He could use you anywhere or in anything. Now, then finally, here's why we labor through the prophecies. Everything that we studied today 
came to pass just as God predicted it would. And so that leads me to my final point. God's word never returns void. In fact, I'll go to the spot where the scripture says that in Isaiah chapter 55, and I'll conclude there. Verse 11, so shall my word, God says, here's how it shall be with it. It shall go forth from my mouth, and it shall not return to me void, or that is empty or fruitless, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And so everything God spoke, again, to these nations came to pass exactly as he spoke it, which means as is the case there, as Isaiah says here, the word of God always accomplishes God's purposes and it always prospers that which it is applied to. So if I apply myself to the word of God, and the word of God is applied to me, it will never be time wasted. Never, no, not never. And it will then prosper or bear fruit in my life every time, whether I see it immediately or later. The same God who predicted these things to this people group and fulfilled them to the T is the same God who has given me promises and spoken things into my life and nothing that he has spoken will come back void or empty. He has chosen me to bear fruit, fruit that will remain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the book of Amos. We thank you for the easy stuff and the hard stuff. We thank